but it's that force, that entity, that thing outside of you that keeps the universe running, that keeps everything together. I get very analytic. I get very scientific. And I try to use that illustration that, look, Big Bang happened. We know it happened. I can show you the evidence where all the stars going backwards in time and space, they all end up at one point. That's when it happened. And we can set the time. We can do all the things in physics and science and cosmology to show you where that is. What was before that? What was there in existence that allowed that to occur? There was some causation. And if you think about it from that perspective, you can call it what you want, but something made it happen. Something made it work. And look outside your window there at that mountain. Look at that beautiful cloud. Look at the trees. Look at what's going on around you on our planet. We have been given such a gift here. Every day should be just gratitude because we are allowed to be here on this planet. It is so beautiful and there is such variety and there's so much going on. And people are absolutely remarkable. And if you let yourself experience them and not worry about politics or whatever else, it's amazing. I I heard heard it through the grapevine. Welcome. It's the AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour, featuring the collected voices of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm Don, an alcoholic in Greensboro, North Carolina. Hey, Don. Hey, everybody. I'm Sam, an alcoholic in Palm Springs, California. Sam, I was shocked when I came to AA to find a group of guys hanging around outside of a church smoking, laughing, cussing, and talking about God. (laughs) And I thought, what is going on here? What have I gotten into? We are not a glum lot. We're not a glum lot. I heard a guy say this in my first year of sobriety. He spoke and he was hilarious. And I was talking to him afterwards and he said, we're serious, but we're not solemn. (laughs) (laughs) That's it. So here's a Grapevine Daily quote from a few weeks back. The laughter in AA is what attracted me from the very beginning. The restorative power of laughter should never be underestimated. I have come to believe that I'm being restored to sanity when my sense of humor is restored and I cease taking myself so seriously. That's from April 1976 from a story, If You Feel Good, You're Not Normal, <laughs> in the book, Happy, <laughs> Joyous, and Free. Great mind book. That's a great one. You know, folks, by the way, you can uh, subscribe to receive a daily quote email at aagrapevine.org. Man, I love these things. It's part of my everyday reading, first thing in the morning. And, you know, you and I know this, but everybody yeah. else can know it now that, you know, we, we've got a little document going of, of capturing the ones that we like that we may want to talk about on the show. And this thing, as soon as you read that, what stood out to me, I remember you sharing several times over the years. One day you found yourself just started singing. Singing in the shower. Yeah. <laughs> Spontaneous. Yeah. And the realization when you realized that you had started doing that. I'm getting well. (laughs) Yeah. Because, well, actually, I didn't realize until that moment. So, you know, it's been three or four years since I spontaneously started singing in the shower because the last few years of my drinking, it was not fun. Mm. It was misery. And to be in AA and to be in recovery and to be able to begin to laugh again and to spontaneously sing again. Yeah. It's a gift. I would guarantee you that I have laughed so much more in my time in recovery than I did in the years prior. There's a lightness about me most of the time, not all the time. And it is just absolutely waiting for joy to show up. Did you, like me, when I came in, I was thinking, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to have to do AA, I'm going to have to quit drinking. There's not going to be any fun anymore, but I'm going to do it. (laughs) It's going to be a long, slow slog through life. Right. And in no time at all, like the quote, what is it with these people? They're happy. You know, I thought that they were going to be really serious and they're going to be sitting in their rooms in their trench coats, smoking cigarettes and trembling and going, 
I think I'm going to drink. Don't do it. No, don't do it. <laughs> and, you know, it's just not the way it is. Yeah. I love this thing that I, I've heard said. I thought that I was going to get a consolation prize and I wound up getting the jackpot. That's it. In my drinking and partying years, I loved hanging out with alcoholics and addicts, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. They're the best people. I still do. They just <laughs> drink and use. Yeah, that's right. They're still alcoholics and addicts. They're still that kind of person that I absolutely love. Yeah. All that crazy energy. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> well, what's happening? Today, we're going to have some fun on the podcast. Well, what do you mean today we're going to have some fun? I'm reading his script right now, folks. <laughs> today, we're going to have some fun on the podcast, exclamation point. We always have fun, Don. <laughs> Not like today. <laughs> well, today we've got a rollicking game of Stump the Thumpers, our big book <laughs> quiz show. Our guest is Greg T, and we're going to get to know him a bit and then play our game. You were talking about consolation prize, and instead you got the jackpot. We're going to see if our <laughs> guest can get the jackpot. <laughs> I'm looking forward to meeting Greg. I understand he's a real corker. <laughs> mm -hmm. What page is that from in the big book? <laughs> I don't know, but it's in there. <laughs> and now, the news. Did it, did it, did it, did it, did it. The August 2023 issue of The Grapevine will be about AA in the military. Stories are due February 15, 2023. Did you ever serve in the military sober? Were you ever stationed overseas or on a ship while trying to stay sober? What were AA meetings like in the military? What were some of the challenges? Did you find AA while serving? Tell us about being in AA while serving your country. You can do that at aagrapevine.org slash share. And now a word from our sponsors. We don't have sponsors? What are you thinking? Oh yeah, we don't do the commercial sponsor thing. Since the grapevine is self-supporting, we don't sell ad space in our magazine, on our website, or in our podcast. Grapevine doesn't even accept donations from AA members. If you want to support Grapevine and this podcast, visit aagrapevine.org slash store. I'm Greg. I'm an alcoholic and addict from Palm Springs, born in California. I'm one of those weird people from Southern California that actually has history here. My family's five generations, so I fully qualify. I started my drinking back in middle school, so I was 13 years old. Okay, yeah, you qualify. <laughs> you started drinking in middle school. Yes, I got into my parents' bar and just thought that was one of the ways to try and... Um, get over some social anxiety. I didn't fit in with all the kids there in school very well. I didn't know at the time. We grew up in, in suburbia in LA, mm -hmm. in an area where I'm gay and I people didn't know what gay was. We didn't even know the word. And it was back in the 60s and 70s and people didn't really talk about that. I knew something was different and I didn't fit in with all my peers. I found that alcohol kind of made a little bit of a buffer. At that time, I didn't drink obsessively. It was just, you know, if I was going out to do something with my friends, I would, you know, go into dad's liquor. And my dad's Southern Baptist, mom's Catholic, so they don't drink. He had it there for guests. And the stuff <laughs> there for so many years, it probably didn't have much alcohol in it anyway. <laughs> but it had enough. It had enough. It doesn't sound like it was a big supply either. Well, it wasn't. And it was funny because... I always thought I was being clever by taking the ones that looked older and less used. And then every, 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 once it kind of scared me because it was like, oh, wait, there's only a little bit left in this one. <laughs> so it proved to be a useful tool at that point. And for me, alcohol in high school, marijuana, and then onward and upward, it was my coping mechanism. It's how I got through those adolescent years. I wouldn't have made it if it hadn't being gay. And I didn't know it. And back then, nobody knew it. But I have uh, autism. 
and I have a very low spectrum. So it's way down on the bottom of the ones. I function pretty well, but it's enough that it makes interaction socially very difficult. We did an interview once with a therapist and my parents literally told me, we knew something was wrong. We just didn't know what to do. And so it was really up to you to figure out what to do that you could make yourself comfortable. Well, absolutely. I mean, at school, they didn't know. They held me back one grade. I mean, I, I got in trouble because I didn't interact with my peers. So it was very weird. It was very strange. And I had to make my way through it. Yes. And by having that alcohol, it kind of made the pains not quite so bad. It was interesting. I was listening to you guys start the show and I was really, really pleased because I don't think I was ever, you know, we talk about happy, joyous and free. Mm-hmm. I wasn't any of that most of my life. Oh. And I, I went through using every drug there is except heroin. I found out when I walked into that first AA meeting, here was a room full of people. I mean, it was full. All these guys were chatting and it was loud and they were laughing, as you said. I mean, I was surprised. It was like, holy cow, what is this? I thought it was the typical bunch of people sitting around in a circle smoking and and kind of crabby and and <laughs> everybody's real serious. And, you know, it and it wasn't, you know, I sat in the back row, of course. <laughs> I walked in that meeting and I knew this is where I need to be. Well, this is where I belong. Yeah. Greg, how old were you when you quit drinking? I was 51. What was going on at the very end that gave you the willingness to come to AA? Anybody in AA probably has a similar story. My using and drinking for my early life worked. In my 20s, it was fun. It was working. I would go to all the parties. And for me to go to a bar and enjoy myself, I needed to be drunk because I couldn't do it on my own. I always had two or three drinks before I went to the bar. Me too. Absolutely. You have to have at least one before you go. So getting through into my 30s, into my mid-30s, it worked. It worked pretty well. And then it started to not. And it wasn't a sudden transition. It's It kind of just got worse and worse and worse until I got HIV. In 1995, I was told that I had two weeks to live. So that period of time, I wasn't drinking because I was sicker than you know what. I've been in the hospital, intubated, all that stuff. But I'll tell you, as soon as the medications came out and I got better, I was back out really, really quickly because I wanted to meet people again. I wanted to be out in society. Um, and it took away some of the pain because every one of my friends was dead. Yeah. So I took that pain away and it let me deal with life. But it wasn't the same. It wasn't fun anymore. It was just a coping mechanism, like you said, Sam. It's what got me through my day. And then it got worse and worse because the drugs became more and more prevalent. The alcohol was more and more often. I didn't think I would get to the point where I had the shakes if I didn't drink. And I did. Mm. And that scared the bejesus out of me. That was enough. I mean, getting the shakes, getting the other issues, getting the fact that our relationship wasn't doing well, something had to give. The lack of clarity in my thinking, I couldn't do the thinking I had done before. My intellectual capacity was less than it had been. My memory is being affected. Was it obvious to you that it was alcohol? Yeah, absolutely. Especially after I stopped and I had sobriety starting. About two months into my sobriety, all of a sudden, I realized I could remember stuff that I had not been able to recall before. Mm. I'm, I'm a physicist. I teach physics. I teach engineering. I was having trouble. After two months, all of a sudden, it was like, wait, oh, I know that fact. Oh, I missed that. Oh, wow. and I started, it started to come back. I did some research into it, and I looked into the neuroscience especially with some of the chemicals, they said it takes up to two years. Well, they weren't wrong. Yeah. And lo and behold, something weird happened. I actually became social. I found because the people in sobriety had that commonality, I could be social and I could talk to them and I could have a relationship with people in the rooms. It wasn't possible for me in the, quote, normie society. I didn't, in AA, I felt comfortable. Hmm. And it was such a warm, nice feeling. And it's it's like, this is my community now. 
I know for a fact, the first five years of my sobriety, I'd get to the promises and they would say, are these extravagant promises? And everybody kind of choruses, we think not. My brain was saying, oh, absolutely. It's, a, it's one of the hardest things ever. It's not going to happen. And then it was the part about sometimes slow, sometimes fast. Mm -hmm. I kept thinking, well, when is it going to happen? Because <laughs> good Lord. But then um, I really thought about it. And it's like, okay, I've had all this time drunk. It's not going to happen overnight to be happy again. Mm -hmm. You don't get the prizes all at once. And it took me all the way up until about my ninth year. And all of a sudden I realized, my gosh, I'm happy. My relationship with my parents is repaired. I've made all those nine step amends and I feel good. I feel content. Um, I got my serenity and it was just the strangest feeling. You know, I go to bed at night and I, I lay in bed and do a quick 10 step. I did it last night and I can remember it really clearly because I sat there and I thought, I didn't do anything mean, cruel or vicious. I didn't say something to anybody. I had a really good day. Oh, yeah. For me, it seemed like I got that feeling after completing the ninth step because that's what freed me from the internal dialogue, the shame and the regret. And now I can live one day at a time. Yeah. When I did my ninth steps uh, work, I, I found that just beginning in it, getting the first few done that I could look the world in the eyes at that point. To add to that, I think that's when our authentic self is able to come out. I think that's who we really are and the pain, the fear and apprehension of the reality of society growing up keeps us from that. And by utilizing these steps and living the steps, and that's one of the things I, would, I think I've recognized, I actually integrate them into everything I do. I bring them into my life everywhere. And I inadvertently will share step work with, if I'm at school, for instance, I will share with the kids something and I'm like, oh, wait, that's from the big book. Oh, wait, that's from the steps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't know it. Greg, okay, so you're a physicist and you apply all the steps in your life. Tell me about, and I, I've been primed by this by Sam. How, do you, <laughs> how does a physicist do step three, made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand him? What is God? Well, that's the part that for me was a huge challenge because growing up with a Catholic mom and a Southern Baptist dad, I learned fairly quickly that the established, what men have done to religion and their hatred of me as a being because I'm gay, because of other situations, I very firmly became atheist. I thought God can't possibly exist because what God would allow disease, what God would allow me to exist as I did in pain all the time. That's not God's way. I really thought there was no God. And my science self was really supportive of that because it would, scientifically, I mean, you can't prove a God. You can't, I mean, it's just not there. After I got sober, I started to look at both step one, three, and 11 very deeply because as a physicist, there are things that exist in the universe that aren't explainable in scientific terms. When you look at, here I am, I am an infinitesimally small speck in our universe. When you look at it on a scale of human existence, there are eight billion of us on this planet. This planet is one of probably, give it a guess, about a trillion planets in just our galaxy. Our galaxy is one of approximately 400 billion galaxies. So to put things on that scope, God in its whatever it is, and I can't, the word is hard for me because it has such connotations. So I use higher power because I think that it works better. But that entity, that thing that exists, that began it all, isn't going to look at me individually out of all the specs in the universe and orchestrate and have strings and do this, do that, do this. But at the same time, when you look at string theory, when you look at 
the Big Bang, when you look at the origins of the universe and where things are on the micro scale, strings are vibrational particles that when they resonate at the right frequency, create a particle that becomes matter. When you take that and you go back in time to the origin of the universe where these energetic particles were created, something caused that to occur. It wasn't there before. And physicists have struggled with this. The concept before the universe began was nothing. There is nothing. I can't conceive of nothing. Yet everything came out of that. Well, something had to cause that. Something had to make that happen. Something created everything there is. Instantaneously, all matter was created. That's a weird thing to think about. So it then ties together the two concepts of higher power and physics, because the two have to meld at that point. And when I recognized that, I could see the perfection of it all, that everything had to happen in order for us to exist where we are. For me, all of the events of my life, as painful as they were, as you know, there wasn't all painful, it was some good things, but as my life continued, everything that happened made me who I am now. If I wasn't an alcoholic, if I wasn't a drug addict, if I didn't go through all those horrible things, I wouldn't be me. And I am so grateful for all of the pain because I was able to go to where I am now. And I am I will never stop being grateful for the steps because it got me here. And I'm getting kind of emotional because it really is a deep felt thing that all of the whole universe made me who I am. Mm. Isn't that a wild thought that the entire universe made? Yes, it is. Greg, what was the first time that in AA you had to confront the idea of a higher power? You did it and and you got to their side and discovered that it worked. I mean, was that slow and gradual or was there an experience? It was an experience. My sponsor and I met very frequently in my early sobriety and first step. That's easy. I knew I was not in control of this anymore. We spoke about the third step for probably an hour and a half, two hours, because he has a very similar philosophy to I in that he's also a science-based individual. He works very broadly in engineering. And so we connected really strongly and we were able to dialogue about it. And as we did, something changed inside me because he was able to kind of unwrap the whole idea of the scope of our universe and how, I mean, I'm putting my words into it now, but it was just an amazing process because we got about halfway through our discussion and it was like a switch. It was like that quickly, something changed. And I went, oh, it was an aha moment. I hate using, Uh, I hate aha moments. (laughs) I know, but they're Uh, real. (laughs) They're real. And this was one, it was like, we were talking and then it was like a light bulb didn't turn on. It's like, that's what it is. That's it. It was, there was an internal feeling. Something changed inside of me. You know, you talk about that warm feeling, but it was a uh, almost like a glow inside, which I don't know if that's a correct description, but oh. my heart opened up. Something made a significant difference. It was significant. It was significant. It was kind. Of, it was life changing, because mm-hmm. I wasn't alone anymore, and I will never be alone. So not only significant, but lasting. Yes, absolutely. I became absolutely convinced beyond any doubt that there is an energy form, an entity, an existence that is out there that created the universe, that created me, and has again i can't say directly because i don't i don't i don't think that's how it works it's beyond words yes it is and it's it's a phenomenal thing and it's beyond comprehension so i i you know i kind of have to stop with words because i don't know how to describe it properly but it it is an ongoing thing i experience all of my life every moment of every day once i got that through the rest of it came almost automatically. It made every other step just so easy. 
Can you give an example of turning your will over to higher power to, in your life and something positive happened out of it? It happens all the time. Simple things like in teaching credentialing process, I forgot to file some paperwork and it was stressful. Well, come to find out, I finally went home and I was like, well, I can't undo forgetting to file the paperwork. The next day, I found out that the office downtown had already done it because they recognized it and they put it through. Every day I run into things like that. If I turn it over, if I just say, I'm not going to fix this, you know, I'm having trouble with my car. Its computer is a thousand dollars. I've put four of them in the car so far this year. And I had Ford put another one in. Two days later, the little check engine light comes on and I got really irritated. I got into myself. I'm like, oh my gosh, I got mad. It was like, okay, Ford, you got to fix it, et cetera. I realized after I'd gone through my day of being irritated, I kind of sat quietly and I thought, you know what? And I don't know where it came from, but you know, sometimes that little voice in the back of your head that a lot of us, including myself, sometimes attribute to the voice of God or whatever entity that is, is like, calm down. It'll take care of itself. Well, lo and behold, I started the car the next morning and the light went off and it ran beautifully and it still does. So I'm not in control of the universe. I can't make strings assemble to become atoms. That's not my job. <laughs> and yes, looking at alcoholism, looking at drug addiction, looking at all of the things that I have that are my own defects. When I turn that over and I just say, look, I can only do so much that is tangible in the now. The rest of it is going to take care of itself through higher power. And I, I'm i like every other human. I do ask. I'm like, oh, please help me with this one. And <laughs> lo and behold, given a little bit of time and patience, if I don't get irritated and do something stupid, it nine out of 10 times resolves itself. And usually in a favorable manner from my perspective. You're describing prayer as being like a recalibration, realignment. Yeah, yeah. That's absolutely true. I'm so glad you said that because prayer is a recalibration. And I start my day every day by a thank you. Thank you that I woke up. Thank you that I'm still here. In my work, I am constantly reminded and amazed at what an amazing planet we live on. What an amazing thing we are presented with that we live in this time when we have technology, when we have all the advantages that we have. I get to see 200 kids a day in my job and they are amazing. They are just so exciting. AA has made life worth living again. Wow. Greg, I want to keep going. I mean, let's let's turn this into a three-hour podcast episode. <laughs> yeah. okay with that? <laughs> but it's time to play Stump the Thumpers! That's a big book! Our big book quiz show. And here's our quiz master, Donnie Wani Ding Dong! <laughs> Thanks, Spammy! I've researched the first 164 pages of the big book. And Dr. Bob's story. Sam, let's keep this simple. I found a few easy questions for our contestant. It's only easy if you know the answer. It's multiple choice. It's as easy as cherry pie. Don, have you ever made cherry pie? Well, maybe it's not so easy. <laughs> <laughs> what will Greg win, Sam? The warm glow of accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. Is that all? And a little heart symbol in the video window? Okay, let's put a heart symbol. <laughs> That's a good idea. I got three questions today. Guess right and gain 2,000 points. That's a lot of points, Don. I, well, but yeah, Greg is an alcoholic. More is better. <laughs> <laughs> Our dopamine receptors are exhausted. We need a <laughs> lot of encouragement. <laughs> there are never, ever enough points. Greg, are you ready? All right, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Finish this sentence. The very last one in There is a Solution. Uh, it's just multiple choice. I'm going to give you four choices. The sentence is, we believe that it is only by fully disclosing ourselves and our problems that we will be persuaded to say, one, damn little to laugh about that I can see. 
two. Yes, I'm one of them too. I must have this thing. Three, what do I have to do? Or four, an alcoholic in his cups is an unlovely creature. <laughs> <laughs> so, finish the last sentence in There is a Solution We Believe that it is only by fully disclosing ourselves and our problems that we're persuaded to say. I believe it's the third one. What do I have to do? Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> the answer on page 29, our hope is that many alcoholic men and women desperately in need will see these pages and we believe that it is only by fully disclosing ourselves and our problems that they will be persuaded to say, yes, I am one of them too. I must have this thing. The answer is number two. Greg, <laughs> you have zero points. <laughs> But, you know, what do I have to do is kind of similar to, yes, I'm one of them, too. I must have this thing. It's absolutely similar, but we know that you're a stickler for exactitude. <laughs> What's the next one, Don? Okay, there are many things the big book is trying to do. What is the main purpose of the big book described in the foreword? One, to give us clear examples of living sober. Two, to teach us how to moderate. Three, to make a nice doorstop. Four, <laughs> to show precisely how we have recovered. Oh, that's, that, I believe it's number four. Ding, 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 ding. Yes, absolutely. The answer is to show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. Number four, to show how we have recovered. You have 2,000 points, Greg. Man, that's awesome. 2,000? <laughs> 2,000 2, 2, points. <laughs> this is the last question in Into Action. Bill says, we are dealing with that most terrible human emotion. What is it? One, anger. Two, jealousy. Three, revulsion. Four, boredom. Number two. Two, jealousy. Ooh, ding, 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 ding. You are correct on page 82. Keep it always in sight that we are dealing with the most terrible human emotion, jealousy. The answer is number two, jealousy. That's 4,000 points, Greg. 4,000 points. have a winner, Don. <laughs> nice work. I tell you what, that last one, as I was reading it, if you couldn't hear the big book being said, anger makes as much sense as jealousy. That's where I went immediately. And then I read the answer because I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because one of the things my mind immediately went to was fear. Ah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, I, that's the underlying thing for all of this. Yeah. Anger comes from fear. A thousand forms of fear what oh now i can't do it. i can't do it from memory a thousand forms of fear jealousy resentment and there, it, he lists about four things there yeah which yeah. if you add all those up it's a lot more than a thousand that's like four thousand things i've got to worry about i'm starting to think you're not really a big book thumper don i'm not a thumper i can't do it i'm not no memory i have to look these things up too <laughs> No, I'm, I'm doing this to try and find a thumper. <laughs> <laughs> well, Greg, tell me, so you won the game. Are you, you experiencing that warm glow of accomplishment? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny because I, I actually am, but I think that comes from being able to just share some of the, the revelations that I've gotten through AA. I think just the steps and what we've done here. I feel absolutely wonderful about sharing every time I do it. it I walk away with that warm feeling. Yeah. Greg, that is such a perfect way of putting that. Thank you. And thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Thanks for being here today, Greg. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's, it's actually really fun now that I've done it. It's really a good experience. <laughs> I thank you for having me. Everything's better afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. <laughs> The policeman said to the drunk, Your eyes look red. Have you been drinking? <laughs> oh, yeah. 
your eyes look glazed. Have you been eating donuts? <laughs> <laughs> it's really not that funny. Thanks for joining us. The AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour is posted every Monday and is produced by AA Grapevine, Inc. We don't speak for AA as a whole. We share the experience, strength, and hope of members to help others recover from alcoholism. Podcast info, including how to call in, is at aagrapevine.org slash podcast. Find AA Grapevine on Instagram and the AA Grapevine channel on YouTube. All things Grapevine are available at aagrapevine.org. If you want to know more about AA, Google Alcoholics Anonymous and your city or visit aa.org.